G'day guys, up next you're gonna see Jason Taylor and Jason has uh, done a wonderful job on the architecture of many large projects here at SSW and uh, not only that, he has uh, like, uh, you know, evangelized a lot of these best practices across a huge bunch of devs here and across our projects. He's put up this clean architecture talk on YouTube, which you can have a look at. It's had hundreds of thousands of views. The logical extension of that is clean testing, and you're going to see that. Now, normally Jason would be here tonight, but he's recorded this from home, and uh, I think you're gonna really enjoy this. Thanks. Hello, and welcome to Clean Testing with .NET Core. My name's Jason Taylor, and I'm an SSW Solution Architect. You can find me on Twitter, at JasonTaylorDev, or on my blog, jasontaylor.dev. Now, recently, I've been talking about clean architecture with .NET Core, and in that talk, I've highlighted the simplest approach to enterprise application development with .NET Core. Tonight, in this presentation, I want to highlight the simplest approach to automated testing with .NET Core. In this approach, I'll show you that tests can be easy to create and maintain. Tests can be easy to understand, provide real high-value documentation for your system, and give you the confidence to deploy to production knowing that it's going to behave as expected. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention that SSW has a cool new SSW Rewards app. You can go to the App Store, search SSW, and download this app. Now, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to share a unique QR code. This QR code is specific to this presentation. You can scan that code, earn some points, and win some prizes. It's a lot of fun. There are a lot of great prizes. You should check it out. So we're going to start tonight off by talking about clean architecture. I'll provide a little bit of background and I'll, I'll provide the main key points. Now, if you're not familiar with clean architecture, I'll also provide a link where you can learn more. We'll follow that up with a talk on clean testing. We're going to start by mentioning the typical approach to automated testing, and then we'll talk about some improvements that we can make to that approach to make it the simplest approach to automated testing. We'll look at some testing tools that we can use. We'll, we'll highlight the three test frameworks that are available out of the box. I'll mention the one that I'll be using tonight. And then we'll talk about some other tools that are geared at improving the simplicity of the code you write and naturally improving the productivity that you have when you're using those tools. Then we're going to jump into the live demos, and this is my favorite part. We're going to create everything from scratch. So you're going to see how to do everything right from the beginning with any problems we run to run into along the way. And you're also going to see that this truly is the simplest approach to automated testing. At the end of this presentation, I'll provide some recommendations and resources, and that'll be it. Let's get started. So with clean architecture, the domain and the application layer are at the center of the design. Now this is known as the core of the system. Now rather than have core be dependent on concerns such as data access and infrastructure, we invert those dependencies. So infrastructure and presentation depend on core. Now this is achieved by adding interfaces or abstractions within core, which are then implemented by layers outside of core. So core has no knowledge of those implementations. Let's think about an example. If we wanted to implement a messaging service, maybe we wanted to send SMSs. Well, we would add an interface, I messaging service within core, and an implementation, let's say Twilio messaging service, inside of infrastructure. Now, because our business logic inside of core is dependent only on that interface, we can change that implementation anytime we want. Maybe we want to tweak it, improve it, maybe we want to move to another provider such as SendGrid. The, the fact of the matter is that core has no knowledge of that implementation, so, so we get great flexibility there. So all dependencies flow inwards and core has no dependency on any other layer. Infrastructure and presentation depend on core, but not on one another. And this results in an architecture and design that is independent of frameworks. It doesn't require the existence of some framework. It's testable. That's why we're here tonight. I'm going to show you just how easy it is to test. I used to say that we can we can we can 100% unit test all of the logic within core and that's still true but i'm going to show you an even better approach that's going to give you much higher confidence when you need to deploy to production 
It's also independent of the UI. Right now we're using Angular, but it really would be a trivial exercise to move from Angular to Vue or to React or to even Blazor in 2021. It's independent of the database. Right now you might be using SQL Server. That's what we're using in this solution. We've moved it to Postgres as an exercise. I've got a friend, Brendan Richards. He loves to write in Postgres, so he migrated it over. It was no problem. It's trivial. Later on, we'll probably move it to Cosmos DB. Fact of the matter is that this design is independent of anything external, and that's what makes it so great. It's the difference between this system, which could last 20 years, and another system that's only going to last three years. And don't believe the business when they say that this is a throwaway application, because you'll probably still be there supporting it in five years' time. Now, in this design, you'll note there are only three circles. You might need more. Think of this as a starting point. Just remember to keep those dependencies pointing inwards. Now, as I mentioned, if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my talk, the Clean Architecture with ASP.NET Core 3.0 talk. This is the presentation that I gave at NDC Sydney last year. And um, in this presentation, I highlight all of the key principles of clean architecture and we and we walk through some code and have a look at an, an actual implementation in .NET Core so that you hit the ground running. All right, on to clean testing. First, the typical approach. With the typical approach to automated testing, the focus is, of course, on unit tests. We follow that with integration tests and then finally UI tests. Now, we know that UI tests are the most expensive to create and they're also the slowest to run. So we tend to, therefore, minimize the amount of effort or the investment that we make in UI tests. In the middle, we have integration tests, so we can test integration of various components in our system. And finally, at the bottom, we have unit tests. We know that unit tests are cheap to create and fast to run, so this is where our main effort is focused. So generally, we'll try to write a unit test first. Now, if we can't write a unit test, we'll fall back and we'll write an integration test. And if we can't write an integration test, then we fall back to UI tests. Obviously, it's some hard to, te hard to test UI logic that we've encountered there. Now, if logic exists in the front end, of course, we need to write UI tests. They're going to be required. Um, if logic exists in ASP.NET Core, of course, we could write some really cool ASP.NET Core integration tests. Um, but with our approach in clean architecture, we're trying to avoid having logic in either of those places. So for everything else, we can write unit tests. Let's have a look at the clean testing approach. So we're here to talk about clean testing. And with this approach, we're going to add subcutaneous tests into the mix. So the main focus is really going to be on subcutaneous tests. Now they're sitting just below the UI and just above integration. They are actually a form of integration test, but they're not going to test anything on the UI. Now, subcutaneous tests are going to give us that higher level of confidence that we want since they also include integration and they don't, they don't result in a large number of mocks. So we're going to be testing a lot of production services. We're going to be programming against a live database. And that's really going to give us a lot of value. Now, of course, it's not going to be exclusively subcutaneous tests with this approach. This will be our primary approach, but where relevant, we're also going to write unit tests integration tests and UI tests. We'll just make a focus on subcutaneous tests. So by this point, I know of course you're asking, what are subcutaneous tests? Well, let's talk about that next. So subcutaneous tests are a test that operate just below the UI layer. And you can kind of interpret that a number of different ways. If you're building a single page application, you might be thinking, well, am I talking about just below the Angular layer? So would I be writing these tests at the API? And you could do that. Um, but perhaps with this approach, we can go one layer lower. We can actually go to the core layer, so below Angular and below the API to the actual core layer. And I'll show you why that's the best approach as far as this design is concerned. Now with subcutaneous tests, we really just want to test the basic inputs and outputs of the system. We want to make sure that we're testing the happy path and any of those kind of known failure paths. Um, that gives us pretty good test coverage and it also means these tests won't be brittle. They're not going to break easily and, and, and that obviously that's going to be ideal. Now, this is only appropriate if we're keeping our logic out of the UI, as we are in clean architecture. And this is going to therefore reduce the need for UI tests because we'll have subcutaneous tests covering a lot of that, um, that behavior anyway. Now, I'm going to show you subcutaneous tests that are easy to write and maintain.
Let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. Let's look at it from the layered perspective. So we know that presentation contains the UI. For a typical SPA, that might be a view front end combined with a web API backend, or if we're building a microservice, that might just be a web API backend, depending on our design, of course. Now core, containing the application and domain layer, contains all logic. It includes commands and queries, entities, repositories, validators, mapping configuration, a whole host of things, everything that we need inside of Core. Now infrastructure represents both the internal and the external infrastructure. Now an example of internal infrastructure might be the database that we're programming against. So we're going to write these subcutaneous tests against a real live SQL Server database. External infrastructure might um, mean something like an external client API. Now that's outside of our control. That's not something we created and we don't want to test that. So for those kind of things, we'll create a mock. Now these subcutaneous tests are going to operate from core all the way through the internal infrastructure layers, but exclude the external infrastructure. So just to make sure we're on the same page, the key points are, we're going to test our commands and queries. So everything inside of Core, and I'll show you that, is a command or a query. Those represent the entry points to our application, the entry points to Core. Then we're going to include our internal services. So we're going to include things like ASP.NET Core Identity. We're going to include um, our SQL Server database, any of those production services that are kind of within our control, that internal infrastructure. We're going to mock out any external infrastructure. So if we're accessing some sort of external client API, we'll mock that out. And first and foremost, we're going to keep it simple because there's really no point in, in, in improving this approach if we can't make it simpler than the existing, the existing approach and provide a whole lot of value when doing that. So now let's have a think about some testing tools. Now we know that with .NET Core, we get three test frameworks out of the box. First, of course, there's XUnit, which we know and love, and I've been using for a good four, four, four years now, I would say. And then there's NUnit. NUnit I used before I started programming in .NET Core. At that point, I moved to XUnit. And of course, there's MS Test. Now that's been around for a long time. Unfortunately, they don't have a logo. I did create one. I'm not a designer, so apologies if it's not the best design. But jokes aside, these are three very capable test frameworks, okay? They all are shipped out of the box with .NET Core, and they all run cross-platform. So you can run them on Mac, Windows, or Linux, whatever your system is, and they're all very fast. Now, when I put together this clean testing approach, I went back and forth. I used XUnit for a long time. I was, I was pretty determined really to stick with XUnit. And then I tried another test framework called Fixie. And I was, I was almost certain that that was going to be the framework that I was going to use. Actually, if you check out my GitHub, I've created a .NET Core template specifically for Fixie. That's how committed I was to choosing the Fixie path. But neither of those solutions quite worked very well for me. So I went back to NUnit because someone said recently that kind of NUnit seems to be taking the lead again. And I wanted to see if that was true. Now, I didn't need much convincing because the problems that I was having in writing um, XUnit um, integration tests and, and, and the things that I didn't quite um, enjoy about writing tests with, tests with Fixie were not apparent in NUnit. NUnit had a really great way for me to manage those global test resources. And obviously, when we're writing these subcutaneous tests, having an effective strategy for managing global test resources is probably the most important thing. If we can't do that effectively, then we can't keep our tests simple and it's just going to be pointless. So in, in, the, in the live demo tonight, we're going to be using NUnit. So let's have a look at some other tools. So first and foremost, Fluent Assertions. So if you've heard of Shouldly, Fluent Assertions is just like Shouldly. Now it allows you to naturally specify the outcome of an automated test. Um, 
it actually improves the readability within tests. So it makes your tests easy to understand. And obviously that's one of the goals that I've highlighted tonight. I want these tests to be easy to understand. I want them to provide documentations of a sort for the for the system that we're creating or the system that some new developers trying to understand. Not only that, one of the greatest thing about Fluent Assertions is that it clearly explains test failure results. You get better test results. And this means that it reduces the need to debug the test. How many times do you have a test failure and you just go straight into debug mode. I find that I'm doing that less and less with Fluent Assertions because it provides enough information out of the box that I can just dive in and fix it. So that's really great. But overall, I found that Fluent Assertions is improving my productivity and simplifying my approach. So I'm really enjoying, enjoying working with Fluent Assertions. I've recently moved over from Shouldly, so there's a lot of similarities, but there's some things in Fluent Assertions that I think are really cool. Next is Mock. Um, I don't think Mock needs much of an introduction, but just in case, it's the it's the kind of the default mocking framework for .NET. It's very popular and friendly, at least according to their repo, it's very friendly. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure how a mocking framework is friendly. It doesn't greet me or, or say good morning or anything like that, but um, but it is very popular, so we'll give it that. Now it supports mocking classes and interfaces, um, so that's great. It's strongly typed, so we're not going to see any magic strings any anywhere. And it's simple to use. Very important for me. No prior knowledge required. So normally when I talk about automated tests, I'm always going to mention EF Core in memory, right? And when I first started doing this presentation, that's exactly what I did. I talked about EF Core in memory and how we're going to use that. But you really have to move away from some kind of fake or test database for this approach. We really need a live database. We want production services. We want we want live infrastructure as much as possible because we want to retest or, or, or exercise that production scenario as much as possible. Because when we're doing that, our confidence is going to be sky high. We know that when it goes to production, we're going to have the expected behaviors. We're not going to have any nasty surprises. So I do love EF Core in memory, but we're not going to be using it tonight. I'm probably not going to be using it for very many tests in the future. Instead, we're going to be using Respawn. So this is a tool by Jimmy Bogard. So in my research, this was something that I found, and this tool is just perfect. It's an intelligent database cleaner for integration tests. And what it does, and so instead of deleting data or rolling back transactions, say after a test, so that you can clean up your database and have that clean state, it just resets the database to a clean checkpoint. And it does that really intelligently. It does that by basically working out the relationships and deleting all of that data. And it's really fast. It's just a pleasure to work with. So we can configure it a little bit as well. So I'm going to configure it to ignore some tables. I'll, I'll configure it to ignore the EF migrations history table um, because it's going to clear all of the data out of the database for each test, right? Um, but we can't clear out the EF migrations history because that actually says that our, our database has been upgraded to the latest version. So we need to keep that there. So we'll, we'll I'll I'll show you how to ignore that. It's it's very easy. Now it supports a lot of databases. Just just to name a few, the SQL Server, Postgres, and MySQL. Um, but there are a few more that it supports. But anyway, it it hits all the points for me, so it's great. Now, if you want to learn more, of course, you can head over to the Respawn repo. Um, but the cool thing about Respawn is it's it's actually a really small utility and it's simple to use. So I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you most of most of um, everything about Respawn tonight. Um, still check out the repo. There's probably you know some other things to learn. Of course, I'm not covering everything, um, but but certainly it is small. It is nice, and I'll show you the key points. So let's move on to the live demos. Exciting switch to my other screen. So this is the application that we're going to be looking at. So this is an application that was generated using my clean architecture solution template. And what we're going to be testing tonight is this to do feature that I've created. Now it's pretty cool. Most to do lists are just one list. Well, I've gone the extra mile for you and I've created multiple lists. Okay. Not only that, you can change the list name. So that's pretty exciting. You can delete the list if you need to, and you can set details on particular list items. So I can set a priority or a note or that sort of thing. Now you can see this as a COVID-19 shopping list. So yeah, we were able to get apples, milk and bread, but unfortunately we haven't yet been able to find any toilet paper, pasta or tuna. So we'll check those off later. I don't know, maybe, maybe we need to check IGA or something. 
Um, I want to show you how easy it is to create your own application using the Clean Architecture Solution template. So just a little bit of background on this template. We'll get into the next slide. So the Clean Architecture Solution template is a .NET Core template package. It's running ASP.NET Core 3.1, Entity Framework Core, ASP.NET Core Identity, and Angular. Um, if you want to install it, it's really simple. From the command prompt, just run .NET new install Clean Architecture Solution template. It installs in a few seconds, and then you can create a new solution by simply running .NET new CA-SLN. So that'll create a new solution based on the Clean Architecture Solution template. And um, that's one way that you can get all of the working code from the demonstrations that I'll be providing tonight, because all of this, um, all of these tests that we'll be creating have have been added to the Clean Architecture Solution template. I'll also be sharing a GitHub repo, which is specific to this presentation, um, because I'm going to keep working on the Clean Architecture Solution template. So it's going to evolve, whereas of course this presentation will be on YouTube for, for quite a while. So I just want to make it easy for people to find the code that we created specifically for this presentation. But they're both worth looking at. Anyway, let's move into the demo. So we're going to move into the clean testing demo. We'll create tests that are easy to write and maintain. And as I mentioned, we're going to use NUnit and also Fluent Assertions, Mock, and Respawn. All right, first I'll give an overview of how the information is actually flowing through this application. So this application is a single page app. It has an Angular front end and an ASP.NET Core MVC back end. The Angular front end is stored in the client app, um, and the MVC controllers are stored in the controllers folder as usual. Now, pay attention to the to-do items controller and the to-do list controller. If I go into here, you can see they're quite small. They just basically contain one or two lines of code. There's no logic in there. So it's clear we've kept all of our logic outside of the controller. And this is one of the reasons why we're not going to target our tests here. There's nothing really that we've created that we would want to test. What we do have here is lots of mediator um, commands. So we're using a tool called mediator to send queries and commands to our, to our call. Now what media will do is it will take one of these queries or commands and associate it with a handler, which would then um, execute that query or command and return the relevant response. Let's have a look at the get to do's query. So you can see the get to do's query at the top here has a DTO. And this is where you could put things like say paging or filtering or searching, any of those kind of regular things. This is a relatively simple example, so there's just no properties in there. And then right below it in the same file, we have this handler. So this is a get to do's handler, and it has all of the logic that's associated with the get to do's query. So the logic in this case is to build and return a to do's view model. And the view model consists of a list of priority levels, and of course, um, a list of the to do lists. And each to do list contains a list of the to do items. So yeah, you can see we can dive right in there. But essentially, the logic's relatively simple. And this is what we want to create our first test for. Now, as I mentioned, Mediator is responsible for kind of accepting a query and matching it up with a uh, handler. And the way that it does that is using these Mediator interfaces. So you can see this query is implementing the iRequest interface. And this basically says, at least in my mind, it says I'm a request and I'll return a to-do's view model. And then the handler implements the iRequest handler interface, which essentially says, I'm a request handler, I handle the get to do's query, and I'll return a to do's view model. So Mediator knows how to find the appropriate handler for the appropriate request. And so with our commands and queries all implemented in these interfaces, essentially the way information flows through the application is we have requests and we have responses. And that's what, the, that's what the controller now does. It just takes a request and flips it into a response. It's really simple. So if we wanted to dive in a little bit deeper with Mediator, we can actually have a look at some of the behaviors that are associated with it. So we have these cross-cutting concerns in Mediator which have been implemented 
as behaviors. So if we have a look at this validation behavior, it's really cool. It validates every single request that comes through the system. So the way that it does that, it basically looks to see if there are any validators. If there are, it executes them. If there are any failures associated with those validators, then it throws a validation exception. Then we've got an unhandled exception behavior here, and the responsibility of this behavior is simply to log an error to whatever provider it is that we've we've configured. Um, and so you can see we've got mediator, and then we've got these behaviors, which are providing a lot of rich cross-cutting concerns type functionality for us. So when we test um, the the these queries and these commands, well, we could, of course, just new up a query and new up a handler and inject the relevant services. We'd be missing out on a lot there. We really want to take full advantage of the mediator behavior pipeline and execute those pipelines as part of our test because um, that's going to be a really important test. Like if we want to um, to to, ch to check that the unhandled exception behavior is working correctly as part of a test, we can do that, but only if we execute these tests using mediator. So when we build our tests, that's that's exactly what we're going to do. So now you've hopefully got a good understanding at the level we'll be targeting these subcutaneous tests at. And really, it's the entry point, the only entry point to the core of our system. So let's go ahead and build our first test project. Now I like to create my test projects in a test solution folder. So I'll go ahead and right click on that and click add new project. Now we're going to add an n unit project. So let's type n unit. Wait for that to come up. Okay, there we go. So n unit test project for .NET Core. So we'll click on that and click next. Now we'll give it a name. I'm going to call it clean testing dot application dot integration tests. And I'll put it in the path tests because I'm replicating that solution folder on the disk as well. So clean testing, application, integration tests. Yep, that looks good. So I'll hit create and that should appear. Okay, good. And so we've got a default test out of the box. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and run that. Control whoop, whoops. Control R T. Wait for it to build. Oh, there's Test Explorer. We'll dock that. Good. Get this set up a little bit better. Okay, good. That didn't take very long. Wonderful. So 115 milliseconds to, to assert dot pass. Not very exciting, but um, everything's working. Anyway, we don't need this sample test, so we'll just go ahead and delete it. Scrolling back down. Okay, I actually do want to add some of the tools that we're going to use with this project. Um, so I'll just jump over to, to the command prompt here. We'll jump into tests and into our new project. Um, and we'll add those packages. .NET add package. First thing we're going to need is fluent assertions. So I'll add that. Um, we're also going to need mock. Good. And uh, I think we'll need respawn as well. Okay, cool. That means we won't have to keep coming, switching back here and, and, and grabbing more packages. We'll have everything we need. Um, now, the first test I want to create is a test that ensures that um, the get to do's query returns all lists and all to do items. Um, now I might end up creating multiple tests for this query, but we'll just start with that one. Now, one of my favorite extensions is the add new file extension. With that extension, I can actually just type in a path such as to do lists queries and a file get to do's tests.cs and it will go ahead and create that directory structure and that file for me in one go which is pretty cool so i created this directory structure to match the same pathing in the application layer so if we come up here we can see to do lists queries 
get to do's. So I created a get to do's test.cs. I don't need a folder in the test because I'm just going to have one test file. Whereas on the application layer, I've got a get to do's folder because that contains all of the files that are related to the get to do's query. But our test um, needs are a lot simpler, so we just have two levels of folders. So let's shell out this test. Now I've got I've got some code that we can use for that, and I'll just paste it in. So we'll need to bring in um, xunit.framework, sorry, nunit.framework, force of habit, and we we need to bring in a reference to the application project. But actually, as part of this subcutaneous test, I've mentioned we need to wire up production services. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to add a reference to web UI, and the reason that I'm doing that is because it has the code to configure those services. So let me add that reference in. Okay, we'll just wait a moment and we should be able to bring that in from the application layer. Yeah, okay, great. Oh, not so good. Let's try that once more. Two. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, so let's have a look at this test that we've built. Uh, we've got a arrange, act, and assert pattern being followed. So developers are easily going to be able to see how this test is structured. Um, we've got a squiggly there. That's something that we have to complete. Um, but essentially, we're newing up an instance of the query. We're sending this query through some kind of send a sync helper function. Now what I, what that will do is when we implement it is it will use mediator to send that query because remember we're going to have that pipeline of behavior um, kind of working for us. And then we're going to assert the result. So we want to assert that the result's not null, a bit of a sanity check there. We want to assert that um, the lists have a count of one and you want to assert that the first um, list its items have a count of six. So you can see Fluent Assertions is already working for us. It's helping us to define these tests, which are easy to understand. So we do need to, to flesh this out. But before we do that, um, we've got a bit of a problem here. We're, we're kind of asserting on some global data. You know, when you look at this test, you kind of expect there's some global data somewhere. And that's going to be problematic because right now, yeah, there's one list and there's six items. But later on, there's going to be other tests and they're going to need different types of data. And when that global data has changed, that's going to break tests over here. And we just want to avoid that problem altogether. So with this approach, we're always going to set up the data that we need for each individual test. So the way we're going to do that, there's a number of ways we can do that. Of course, we can program through the existing commands and queries. Um, but in this particular case, I want to create an object graph. So I, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to add an helper method, doesn't exist yet, called add, add async, which just allows me to add a bunch of entities. So in this case, I'm creating a single shopping to-do list with six items, similar to the ones that we saw in the demonstration before. I'll just bring in the namespaces for the entities and uh, yeah, I think we're good to go with that. So obviously in order for this test to run, it's not going to run right now. We need to configure the services um, and we need to flesh out those helper methods. So, so we need to set up some supporting infrastructure. And so the way to do that is we're going to create a new file whoops, called testing cs and this is kind of going to be our global static file for managing our um, global test resources and we're going to use x unit, uh, n units attribute setup fixture and what setup fixture does is it basically identifies a class that contains a one-time setup attribute or a one-time teardown attribute so that's our um, global test setup and cleanup in this class so we're going to go ahead and create a one-time setup method. So that'll be run before all tests in this assembly. And we'll call it void run before any tests. Very explicit. Okay, good. And why don't we add the um, stubs for those helper methods that we began creating. Clean that up, and we need to bring in a reference to Mediator, using Mediator. 
Good, okay, that's a good start. So we could go back now to our test and actually import this file and um, get rid of those squigglies so that at least our test is, is kind of ready. We haven't implemented the stubs, of course, but we'll get to that. So the way I like to do that is with this using static directive. So we'll go using static testing. And what that does is allows us to reference this testing um, class and without actually specifying the testing names, we can access all of those static resources. So instead of saying testing.addAsync, we can just say add async. And here we can just say send async. So it's a really nice way to access these shared um, static resources that we're going to be working with. I'll clean this up a little bit. Good. Well, let's go back and finish off our testing.cs class. So the first thing that I want to do is bring in the configuration. So we're going to need configuration, which is going to kind of determine uh, what database we're going to be connecting to by way of config, uh, connection string and also um, how to configure identity server because we're using ASP.NET Core identity with identity server in memory. And so we need a little bit of configuration there as well. Uh, so I think what I might do is I will drag this across to our testing project, the existing configuration from Web UI. And we'll need this piece of configuration. Um, now this just means that identity server can run in development mode. We won't need to, for example, configure a SSL certificate. We could do that, um, but it's kind of above and beyond what we need for these tests, I think. So I'll take that and paste that in here. Um, we don't need anything from these files now, so we'll just go ahead and delete it. Okay, and we'll change the database name. So we're going to have two databases locally on development. We'll have our clean testing DB is where we'll do our you know sanity checks against, and then we'll have our clean testing test DB, which is going to be separate, and it's what these application integration tests will run against. And we definitely want a separate DB because um, we're going to use respawn. To basically wipe this database all the time pretty much when every test runs this this database will get wiped um, so it's good to have a separate one so that looks good i'll know one thing here so it says use in memory database so we need to set that to false so that's just a little feature i added to the clean architecture solution template basically i want to well, i want people to be able to get up and running quickly so out of the box by default it just uses an in memory database which means you can have an f5 experience where you don't have to set up any infrastructure um, and then when you're ready to you know upgrade your solution to use sql server or postgres or cosmos db you can switch it to something else Okay, we we'll just make sure that, yep, that's copying to the output directory, so that's right. Uh, so we can go ahead and, and load that configuration. So I'll steal a little snippet from my cheat sheet and paste that in. Okay, so you can see that we're using the configuration builder and we're going to grab the appsettings.json from the current directory and we'll add environment variables and we just want to store that um, as a as a field on this class so private static i configuration whoops configuration okay good oh Hmm, <laughs> that's weird. Um, did I do that wrong? There needs to be configuration root. Ah, uh, see, <laughs> whoops. Okay, so that needs to be inside the class. There we go. Okay, good. So it's not in use yet. Okay, so now we can go ahead and wire up our services that we're going to use. So we'll say var services equals new service collection. We'll fix that up, bring in the namespace. Awesome. And then we're going to bring in a reference to startup. Because in an ASP.NET Core application, the services get wired up in configure services. 
So we're going to reuse this. We want to use that same configuration for our testing services, which sure makes life easier, right? So a new instance of startup can be created from Web UI, and we pass in the configuration, and then we can call startup dot configure services. Right, so amazing. So all of our services are configured just like as if it was a production application. Same configuration, amazing, right? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. If we were to run that now, we'd actually get an error, um, and that error is the object reference error. And the reason is that when we go to configure the identity services, it's actually going to be looking for an iWebHost environment. And without that iWebHost environment, it fails to create. Now, I had to dig into that ASP.NET source code to figure this out, but I found out that the best approach for this is just to create a mock with two properties set. So I'll show you how to do that now. So we need to do that before we call configure services because identity is going to be looking for this iWeb host environment. So services.add singleton. And let's see, we're going to do a mock.of i. Can we bring in mock? Yes. Web host environment. Bring in that. Great. And it's going to be w dot application name will be equal to clean testing dot web UI. And this is some nice little syntax from um, mock environment name equals development. Okay, good. So if we run that now, we're not going to get any problems when we try to add the identity services. Um, next thing we want to do is just add a scope factory. And we'll be using this scope factory um, whenever we require a service. So if we're, if we're using um, the service provider to get, say, a DB context or mediate or a current user service, we'll use the scope factory because we want our tests to be as isolated as possible. Um, so we'll use this scope factory to create services within a separate scope. And it's somehow it's somewhat similar to how we'd operate within ASP.NET Core anyway. Um, being that each request would get unique um, a unique services scope. Okay, good. So that's pretty much our service registration complete. And now that we have this scope factory, we can go ahead and complete this add async method and um, send async method. So using var scope equal to scope factory dot create scope, we can now get our DB context. So scope dot service provider dot get service application DB. Oop. like that, ah yes, and we can um, call context.add, and we just pass in the entity. So this is a pretty cool method from EFCore. Um, you don't have to specify the type, it'll infer that from the, um, from the um, argument that you specify. And then we can just await context.save changes async. Just like that. Okay, so that'll be a really useful method. We'll be able to pass it any entity or any kind of object graph, and it'll go ahead and try to um, persist that with Entity Framework Core. So that's we'll use that primarily for setting up test data, right? Next, we're going to implement send async. I'll go ahead and steal a little bit from here. In send async, we're going to take a, an I request um, and we'll use mediator to um, execute that request and return the result. So return await mediator.send request. Okay, so that's it. With those two in place, we should now be able to run our test. Um, let's have a look. So expand that out a little bit. And we'll just go run all. Fingers crossed, right?
There we go. Okay, wonderful. It was pretty slow on that first run. Hopefully we can get that running faster because 4.4 seconds is too slow. So that was great. So it ran, but if we were to run it again, we might encounter a problem. And what do you think that problem will be? Well, since you can't answer, I'll answer for you. The reason that this test failed is because we now have two lists in the database, right? So expected result.list to contain one items, but found two. So the assertion message is really clear. Fluent Assertions is really great at that. So what's happening, of course, is we're setting up this data every time. Every time the test run, we're adding a new shopping list, we're adding all those items that are associated with it. So yeah, it'll pass the first time and then fail every time after that. So this is where we need to bring respawn into the mix and actually reset our database to a clean state for each test. So let's do that now. We're going to add that into our testing.cs. Now remember earlier, um, I added respawn in from the command line. Um, let's, take, let's take a quick peek just to remember. So here's respawn and mock and fluent assertions. Those are the three tools that I bought in. Okay, so up here, after we've finished our configuration there, we want to add in a new checkpoint equals new checkpoint, and that's coming from respawn. Okay, we're going to provide a little bit of configuration. I mentioned earlier that we want to ignore um, the EF migrations history table, and so to do that, we can say ignore tables and that requires an array so a new array and the table we want to ignore is ef migrations history i spell all that right it looks pretty good okay so we'll bring that in and i'll just make that static and clean up those namespaces. Whoops. Okay, good. So we have our checkpoint, and, and the way that we use that is we call reset on the checkpoint when we want to reset the database back to a clean state. So um, I'll, add a, I'll add a new method, a static method called reset public static async task reset state. We'll call it reset state. Await checkpoint dot, dot reset and uh, reset needs a connection string. So we we'll use our configuration to get our whoops default connection string. I just want to make sure that's right. Um, there it is default connection connection that's good okay so there we go so that we can use that to reset our state but how are we going to do that well we need um, some setup logic for every test that we run and that setup logic can call testing dot reset state so we'll reset the state before we run the test um, so that we're ensured that the 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 database will be in a clean state ready to accept our test okay so I'll create a new test base class and inside of that class we'll add a setup method from X unit sorry n unit framework I'm gonna, set, I'm gonna be saying that for a long time public async task setup we can make it async no problem and we'll say await um, reset state and of course we have to use the um, using static directive um, so that we can do that using static testing. So that's nice and easy. Um, that's looking nice and clean and we can see that all it does is reset the state on setup. So if we go ahead and um, inherit this test class from our test base and run that test again, let's see how we go. So obviously um, it should reset the state of the database then Add in the test data, then perform the query. Yeah, and we can see it. we can see it's already done. Um, so that's great. So now we can run that multiple times, and each time uh, respawn is going to intelligently reset the state of our database back to a clean state, which is amazing. And it's not going to play with the um, 
the EF core um, migrations table, um, which which is good because we we don't want it to mess around with that. Okay, so I think we'll create some tests for the create to do list feature. So back over to here, we'll add a new file um, to do this forward slash commands forward slash create to do this uh, tests.cs. So I'll add that in and uh, I'll add the stubs for three tests that we'll create. So we're going to create a test that test validation should require minimum fields. Then we're going to create a test which requires a specific validator. Sorry, tests a specific validator should require a unique title. And then finally, we're going to create a test that says should create to-do list. So given valid uh, input should create a to-do list. So let's bring those in and get to work. So for the first one, we'll go ahead and set up. Oh, let's bring in our testing class using static testing and we'll go ahead and inherit from test base. Good. Clean up the namespaces. Okay. So the command that we're going to be testing equals new create to do list command. Good. And we're going to use um, fluent actions. Fluent actions from fluent assertions has some really cool little um, helper methods for us. So we can say invoking, um, how's it go? Like this, sync, async command. Why is that not working? Ah, oh, because I cleaned up the, um, the using statements at all it also cleaned up my using static testing because it wasn't in use using static testing there we go okay so we run that oh, of course we've got to fix up oh, must be getting tired send async so there we go should throw validation exception that's what happens if there's a validation error the behavior picks it up and it throws a validation exception so we need to bring in that specific um, validation exception okay just like that so let's run that test cool Yep, so should require minimum fields passes. So this is a pretty basic test. Later on, um, or, or at least in the clean testing uh, solution that I'll be committing to GitHub, you'll see some specific tests of validation where we're checking for specific errors and specific conditions. So that's a little bit more useful. So this nest test is going to be um, quite similar. It says that it should require a unique title. So each, each to-do list must have a unique title. So let's steal some of this code and we're going to set this test up a little bit. So I want to start by creating a to-do list, right? Setting up some test data. So we'll call await send async new create to-do list command. And we'll pass it in the title and the title can just be new list. Okay, so now with that in place, there's already a list in the database called new list. So our create to do list command can specify that same title. Okay, so there's our command. And now we can call await send async on that command. And we should get a validation exception on that as well. So we'll run that. Okay, that didn't quite work. Should require unique title for a create to do list. And what was the error? One or more validation errors have occurred. I'm kind of expecting that a validation error should have occurred, but I didn't expect it should fail um, because we expected it. Throw validation exception. One or more validation errors has occurred. It's this test. 
Okay, so let's 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 think about this. So we're sending async create to do list command. So there's a new list in there. Then we're creating a new command. We're sending that. Yeah. Okay. Easy. So we were sending that um, command as not part of this invoking where we were actually able to catch that exception and assert on it. Um, so my mistake. So we'll run that one again. Good. Okay. So the validation exception was thrown and therefore this test has passed. So for the final tests, should create to-do list pretty straightforward. Um, we'll create out this command again. We'll give it a title. New list, pretty boring. It'll do the job. We want to, we want to, okay, so if we execute this command, what it's gonna give us back is a list ID. So send async um, command. So we'll get back a list ID from that command. I guess I guess we should have a quick look at the implementation because you haven't seen it before. So we have a command which accepts a title and a handler which will take that command or that request and create a new to-do list returning the ID of that list. So that's all it does. And so we can get that list ID, but what are we going to assert on? It's not not very interesting just to assert on the list ID. So I think we need a new helper method. We need we need to be able to get the the list that was persisted to the database so that we can assert on that. We can then we can then check a wide variety of things. So our new helper method would be I need an await there. Await find async and um, the list ID. And, and, and we'll have to use generics here, so we'll specify what we're looking for because um, we want to be able to make this highly reusable. Um, so we're looking for a to-do list. Okay, cool. Why don't we just go ahead and implement that method now? So we're going to implement it in testing. Um, we've got our add async. Um, I'm going to I'm going to add it right above that. <coughs> so. public static async task t entity find async t entity int id okay and it's going to be similar similar to this one we're going to need that that context so we'll grab that Okay, return await context.find async t entity and the ID. There we go. So that'll allow us, given a, a specific entity type and, uh, and the ID, a primary key, we can find that entity and return the result. Now this will return null if it couldn't be found, otherwise it will return the entity itself. So back here, that's working well. So now we can do our assertions. So we'll say list dot should oops not be null. So that's a good start. List dot title dot should dot be command dot title the title that we specified. Um, list dot created. So every time. Um, an entity is created, we automatically record a created date and time. Um, so we can say list.created should be, let's say be near, oops, be near, is that, oh sorry, be close to, be close to date time dot now. We can specify a precision here. Um, so we might specify a precision of 10 seconds. That should be more than we'll ever need. Um, okay. Um, this reminds me, actually, the other thing that this this will automatically do for us is it will store the user ID of the user who created this list, the user that was logged in at the time this list was created. Um, but we're not managing any of that here, so I think we need a another 
helper method. Now, what we're working with is a clean database. So we don't have any users in the database. So why don't we add a method which will create a user on the fly and give us the user ID. So we can do that as part of our, uh, of our test setup. Later on, we might like to have some default users. That's something to think about. So we'll add it in at the top here. So user ID equals, um, we'll call that await run as default user async. So, that, so later on, maybe we, we could specify some properties of a user that we'd like to run as, such as the roles that they belong to or the username or whatever. Um, but for now, really what we just want is a user ID. Um, so let's go ahead and implement that in our testing. Okay. And so this is going to take a little bit of work. So I'm going to, instead of boring you by typing all of this out, I'll use my cheat sheet and add these in. So we want to run as a user and we're going to do it maybe just here. So you can see I've added two methods, run as default user, which we'll call run as user async with these credentials. Run as user async will basically, you know, get the user manager, ASP.NET Core Identity User Manager of type application user, um, which has been configured. Just bring this in. When newing up a user, an application user, we're specifying the username equal to the username and the email equal to the username, because we're really just passing a pretend email there. Um, and then we're calling user manager dot create async, passing in the user and the password. And that essentially gives us a result. Now, if that result is successful, um, which we're assuming it is obviously here, because we're not checking it, we're saying that the um, current user ID is equal to the user ID, and we're returning that current user ID. So we're storing it in this uh, static class. So I'll add that in. That's here, right at the top. Um, but we're also returning it. So it's kind of a dual purpose there. So you're probably wondering, well, what are we going to do with this variable? We haven't made it kind of accessible to, to anything external. Well, we need um, to replace the current service registration, I current user service, with our own um, mock um, current user service. And the reason for that is is because the current user service that's current that, that's in place at the moment um, is in web UI and it's using the HTTP context to 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 work with ASP.NET identity to find the current user. So we're not going to do that. We'll have our own mock. So we're going to register that up here. So that takes a little bit of work. First, we have to remove the existing registration, um, and then we have to add in our, our new registration. So I'll use my cheat sheet for that. And we're going to add that in just after configure services, because we need to do it after the initial registration has been created. So you can see we're going to replace the service registration for iCurrent user service. And we'll do that by first finding the current registration descriptor. And then simply calling services.remove. After that, we'll use our friend mock to create a mock of the iCurrent user service where the user ID is equal to the current user ID, and that's transient, so it's always going to return the latest current user ID. And so that's all we really need to do there. Quite, quite, quite good now that it's up and running. We do have one other thing though. Remember, before each test is run, we're resetting that database to a clean state. And of course, that's going to delete this user that we've created on the fly. So we need to reset current user ID back to null. And we can do that within our reset state method. There we go. So with this approach, we can always run as default user async and get a new user ID to be um, to form part of our test. So back to create to-do list tests. So we've got our user ID, so let's use it. List.createdby.should be user ID. Okay, and that's it. So let's give this test a run and see where we went wrong or if we were lucky and we got it right the first time. That would be nice. 
Okay, yeah, we got it right the first time, so that's great. Um, so there's an example of creating a to-do list. We've added a, another couple of helper methods to really get us going. So let's run all of these tests. Okay, cool. So to run all of these tests takes 3.2 seconds. Um, do I have an extra namespace in there? Oh yeah, of course. So four tests, 3.2 seconds. So not super fast. I have seen quicker results on my local machine. This morning I ran 18 tests in 1.8 seconds. So that's the results I'm looking for. I want them to be super fast. So 1.8 seconds, right? That's about 100 milliseconds per test. So that's that's fast. I'm really happy with that result. But let's continue. So why don't we finish up by seeing how easy it is to create tests now that we have all of this infrastructure in place. Um, let's add some update to-do list tests. So I've got my commands folder here. So I'll just click on that and press Shift F2. Update to-do list, update to-do list test.cs. And again, I won't bore you with the details. I'll grab the code that I created earlier. Okay. Oh, we need to bring in our testing class. Test space. And we'll paste the tests in. So let's have a look at these tests. Ah, oh, here's a trick. I need to bring in all of those namespaces, right? If I hit Control A, Control X, Control V, I can then press Alt Enter and add missing usings. That's kind of cool. Clean it up a bit. There we go. So here's our first test. Should require a valid to-do list ID. So we're basically saying if we want to update a to-do list, we need a valid ID. So we're testing that by supplying an invalid ID, obviously, because we haven't set up any data, and, and, and asserting that it throws a not found exception. Next, we've got should require unique title. So we saw an example of this um, in the create to do list command. So first we're creating two lists. We're creating one that's called new list, one that's called other list. And then we're uh, creating a command called other list. Again, we're updating it um, with, that, with the list ID that was created and trying to change it to the name of an existing list. And this is where we're, we're diving a little bit deeper with the validation. So we're sending that command and we're saying, yep, it should throw a validation exception where the errors, the validation errors contains the key title. And that's referring to um, the title property of the to-do list. And it's saying that errors.title, the list of errors that are associated with title, because there could be more than one, should contain the message, the specified title already exists. So here we are testing detailed validation rules um, as part of our subcutaneous test. And that's kind of interesting because we know that this is a, a, a mediated behavior we've, cr we've created, uh, a cross-cutting concern which validates all requests through the system. And you know what? We could write some really nice unit tests for this functionality using fluent uh, validations unit testing functionality. But by testing it this way, We've actually tested it independent of the validation technology chosen. So if these tests run fast enough, or if they don't cause us too much pain by running a little bit slower, we can run with this. We don't have to go ahead and write unit tests for this. So I'd say, um, you know, run with this approach until it's, until it's too painful. If you find it too slow, then go ahead and create unit tests. So I'm showing you the simplest approach here. Um, but I'm not saying don't write integration tests, don't write unit tests, don't write UI tests. Use those tools in your tool belt where necessary, but consider writing subcutaneous tests first because they're really easy to write and they test a lot more. They give us a lot more confidence. Anyway, let's continue. So this 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 test here should update to do list. Um, this is similar to the create to do list command. So we're running as a user. 
Um, we're creating a list, setting up some test data. We're updating that list. We're specifying an updated list title, and then we're asserting on the result. So here we're asserting on the last modified result, making sure that those fields have been set and those fields have been set to the correct value. So that's it. Looks like I've got some extra stuff happening here. Um, let's try and clean that up. Good. Why don't we run all those tests? Okay, fantastic. So we've finished running all of those tests, all of them passed, and you've seen just how easy it is to start writing tests in this fashion. Adding new tests is really easy. Um, really, we're just focusing on the tests now, our, our infrastructure is in place. So if you want to check out the complete set, I'll be sharing a GitHub repo at the end of this presentation. Or as I mentioned earlier, you can just go .NET new CA-solution and that will scaffold you out a new um, clean architecture solution based on the clean architecture solution template. Okay, so finally, let's wrap it up with some recommendations and resources. So the first resource I'd like to share is that repo. This is the clean testing repo, which includes all of the code that I've demonstrated tonight, plus more tests. There's about 18 tests in there. You should be able to get those running pretty quick on your machine. Next, there's the SSW's rules to better unit tests that have just been updated, so check them out. There's a lot of things in there that I didn't cover tonight, which will really improve your unit testing um, capabilities. And next, these two repos were the primary source of inspiration for this approach. I kind of spent at least a few weeks researching, trying to figure out what, what really is the simplest approach to unit testing, and it wasn't until I found these two repos that I, that I was on the right path. So check out Contoso University by Jimmy Bogard. This is built using Razor Pages. It's running on XUnit and um, it has this subcutaneous testing approach. So it's really worth a look. And then check out the Fixie demo by Patrick Loy. Um, it has um, these tests running on Fixie with that, with that subcutaneous testing approach. They're all different. In, in a variety of ways. Obviously, I've set mine up to suit my needs um, and they've set theirs up to suit theirs, um, but they're all worth a look and you can learn a lot from each of these repos, so highly recommended. So I'm excited to announce that in June, I'll be running the Clean Architecture two-day workshop for the first time. It's hands-on and we're gonna build everything from scratch. So it covers everything from clean architecture um, to clean testing. And uh, at the end of it, you'll understand the full solution template You'll be able to build your own for your own organization, or you'll be able to use the existing one if it suits your need. So it's running on June 25th. I, I really hope to see you there. Okay, in summary, clean tests are simple to create, maintain, and understand. Because they're simple to understand, new developers can use them as documentation for your system. They're configured to run production services against a real database. And you saw today one of the best things or one of the things you didn't see is we didn't spend time creating a whole bunch of mocks, which just is painful. And because of that, we don't have to maintain a large number of mocks. We just have those two mocks just to configure those services in the way that we'd like them to behave. So we use testing tools such as Fluent Assertions, Mock, and, um, and, and others to improve the simplicity of the code we write and also to increase our productivity. And we saw that Respawn was an amazing tool for resetting the database state. We were able to establish a checkpoint and reset that checkpoint at the beginning of each test, making sure that we had a clean state in which to run that test. And that that's one of the things that helps to make these tests really fast. We're not messing around with kind of restoring databases or running transactions or kind of truncating tables. It does this really well. It does it intelligently um, and it does it by, with, with deterministic deletion. So you can learn more about that on the repo. So with this approach, we have better test coverage and we have higher confidence in our system. We know that with these tests covering close to 100% of the functionality within core, we'll be confident to deploy to production. 
And the behavior that we're going to see in production is the behavior that we'd expect to see. So that's amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. So as promised, here's the QR code. If you scan it, you can collect some points and earn some prizes and earn some prizes. There's some pretty cool prices. You can see there's a Google Home Max there, a smart band and a, um, a really cool keep cup, which has a digital thermometer on top, which I really like. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions or you can raise an issue on the GitHub repo that I've created. Um, have a great night and thank you. All right, well, that was fantastic. Uh, Jason is a super organized speaker. I love watching that. I see so many arguments and conversations that I was CC'd in. He's so good at distilling that down into a really uh, understandable presentation. Now subscribe, there's lots more uh, content on SSW TV. We're doing it uh, every, two, every two weeks, so you'll see plenty of stuff. And uh, you can uh, fill in the eval form for Jason um, and give him some good feedback and some uh, harsh feedback. Uh, he can only improve with harsh feedback. Plus, if you look at all these other videos, he's very good at responding to all the comments. Uh, sometimes people tell me that the best parts about his videos are the comments under them. So uh, with that, this is Adam Kogan signing off for SSW TV.